now. And welcome, Kathy. We're so excited to learn about Cricket Crawl. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Well, it's really wonderful to be here, even if it is virtual. And I am Kathy Strager. I am trained as a naturalist. I've been a naturalist for over 20 years, and, and I'm, I'm trained as an entomologist, really. I studied bees first. Um, but I became fascinated with singing insects. And um, I'm going to talk tonight about a couple things. I'm going to talk about the natural history of singing insects. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the cricket crawl and kind of interweave those things throughout the evening and kind of follow my slides. Um, so I'm fairly informal. Normally when I do this in person, I would, I would welcome questions. And I often love to see kind of where the audience is and, and what they're curious about. So, so please, if you're curious about things, definitely ask. Um, this is actually a common true Katie did that we're looking at right now. And this is something that... Um, we're gonna find out how they sing. So let's get started. First of all, I'd like to say thank you before we start because um, I wouldn't be here talking about this and Crick and Crawl wouldn't be happening, which is the citizen science event that I'm gonna talk about without the USGS, um, the USGS Bee Inventory and Monitoring Lab, Sam Drogi mainly, without the Natural History Society of Maryland and without the Audubon Naturalist Society. That's kind of where I come from is Audubon Naturalist Society. So um, those three folks, those three uh, entities are wonderful groups and they all help the cricket crawl to happen um, by promoting it, being a part of it. So why sing? If you're an insect, there's plenty of insects, but not all of them sing, right? But we have these singing insects that come out at the end of summer and they sing their heads off. Um, so why are they singing? Why are they singing? And I always ask my audience, why are they singing? And usually people understand that they're singing, they're singing kind of like birds are singing. So the males are singing to attract females, right? And maybe even to hold a territory at times too. So they're very similar in birds that way, in, to birds that way. But the way that they sing, the mechanism for singing is very different. But you know, with the singing, it takes a lot of energy, right? And it's kind of hard to do. So why would you, why would you sing? And, and, and then this group that we're gonna talk about tonight, the, the Singing Orthoptera, they have, it's been very successful for them. So what's going on? So can you, everybody see the slide? Everybody can see the slide. There is an animal hidden in the slide. It's a cricket, it's a little ground cricket. Hopefully everybody can see that. I'm circling it with the, um, the cursor. Um, so that animal, if it's a male, it's singing to attract a female. And um, it's spending a lot of energy to do that. But it also makes itself vulnerable too, right? So can you guys see this little green thing that's kind of attached to it right there? Mm -hmm. uh, attached to it? Yeah. That's, um, that is an external parasite. Pretty cool, huh? That means that it's another insect that has actually found this cricket and parasitized it. So when you're singing, you're no longer invisible. Even if you're as cryptic as this cricket, even if you're as well hidden and it's hard to see you, but when you sing, you still stand out, right? So singing must be pretty important to keep singing even if it opens you up to predation and parasites, things like that, right? Well, it's really important because it advertises how good they are as a mate. And it's, I, I make the analogy for dating. So, so this is like dating, right? It's like getting out there on the scene. And old school dating was going to a bar or going to your church, right? To, to find a, a possible mate. Um, but then we have the internet, right? And we have things like Tinder and all that kind of wonderful stuff to, uh, to date. Well, crickets figured out long ago that you could increase your mate choice and you could advertise yourself much more widely and advertise your fitness and how good a mate you were by singing. It carries a long distance um, and it's, a, it's an excellent way to get a lot of different mate choice, a lot of different individuals um, to communicate with a lot of different individuals. So, but it does open you up to some predation, but it's, it's worth it. It's very successful. 
Um, there's different methods of making sound as an insect. Um, some of the insects that make sound, we can't hear. Uh, they're either making very soft sound that's more like vibrations, or the sound is very high, it's supersonic, and it's above our hearing. So I'm going to talk a couple of ways. So that there's some, there's the crepitation is sound produced by insects snapping their wings. I always love that word, crepitation. And you can see these band-winged grasshoppers, like the Carolina grasshopper right now, um, and they're usually flying ahead of you in sort of field or meadow situations, and um, they're snapping their wings, which is crepitating. Um, and this is a courtship display. It's actually saying, look at how well I can snap my wings. I'm, I'm a really good mate choice, <laughs> right? So there are other members in this singing orthoptera family that stridulate. And there's some different stridulatory ways of making sound. The, um, the short horned grasshoppers, the smaller grasshoppers that are usually day singers, they use, um, they use a hind leg, a femur or a, like a thigh on their hind leg and their wing, which rub together to make sound. A lot of these um, short horned grasshoppers are, they have a very high pitched song that they're very difficult to hear and, and some are, we can't hear them because our human ears don't pick it up because they're so high pitched. But the ones that I'm going to talk about mostly tonight are going to be using a stridulatory mechanism, basically a body part rubbing mechanism that involves both of their wings. So what they're doing is they're taking the edge, the leading edges of their wings, and they're rubbing them together. And they have these modified wing edges. They have a file on one edge and a scraper on the other. So little teeth on the file and the scraper runs up and down the teeth very quickly as if if you have a comb and you ran your thumb along the comb teeth to make that sound, right? And they do that very quickly and it produces the sounds that we hear. Now, they also are making sounds that sometimes we can't hear. So a lot of the ones we're gonna talk about tonight, they're making audible sounds that we can hear, but within those songs, there are some, there are, um, there are notes that actually the, the katydids and crickets can hear, but we can't, um, that helps differentiate them. And this is true for all of the sound producing species in the crickets and katydid groups. Um, and just a, another thing here, Lang Elliott and Will Hirschberger took this wonderful photo of the, the, the wings, the leading edges of the wings. And I wanna say that without Lang Elliott and Will Hirschberger, I couldn't give this talk um, because they have done not only great photos, but um, they've done a lot of recording, especially Will Hirschberger. And um, ha he has graciously made those available to me and to Cricket Crawl, um, to anyone who wants to do outreach about insect and sound production. So before I talk about crickets and katydids, I have to talk a little bit about cicadas because everybody comes to me and says, Kathy, I hear these daytime singing katydids. And I say, mm -mm, you're hearing cicadas, right? So cicadas are daytime singers. And the animals that we're going to be listening for during the cricket crawl are all nighttime singers. But I want to talk a little bit about cicadas, okay? They have a very different method of sound production, and they're very fascinating, and they're really a part of our summers, right? And I think everybody's walked out the front door in the morning and heard a cicada when it's about like, you know, 85 degrees in the morning, and it's just gross. It's like the middle of July, and, and you know, there's that cicada singing. It's usually a morning cicada. This picture is actually of a periodical cicada, and their emergence um, happens every 17 years. But the annual cicadas come out every year. Their life cycle is usually about two years underground. They have very strong muscles in their thorax. And I'm gonna go back here for a second. So this, this plate right here is a timbal. And inside the animal that you can't see in this, inside the animal are these muscles that pull on that timbal and pop it back up. And that's what this picture is. This is the inside of the cicada. And this is the muscle that's pulling that timbal. And they do that very quickly. They have super rapid muscles. These super rapid muscles, you don't find them except in the cicada muscles that you, they use to make their song, which tells you how important it is to get to advertise your fitness, right? Especially for mate choice. Um, 
And most of their lives, most of the cicada lives are spent underground. They're root feeders, um, they're vegetarians, and um, they emerge and they live for a fairly short amount of time. And they're re really their whole point is to find a mate. And that is by the male singing, the females listening, um, making that choice, deciding um, which one they're going to choose. Now, there's three different species of um, cicadas that are really common in our area. And this one in particular, the Northern Dust Singing Cicada, is one that we often hear right at dark. So it's right before dark. And this is the one that confuses everybody. Everybody thinks it's a Katie did, right? But it's actually a cicada. Did everybody hear that? Most people? Okay, good. <laughs> so cicadas are found in our area. There's a, there's a ton of daytime singers. I, I wanted to, everybody to hear that, that dust singing cicada because I think that that one is often confused for a Katie did. So if you are going out in the evening and you're going to listen for these evening singers, just know that if it isn't quite dark yet, you're probably going to hear these dust singing cicadas. And there's the species, the dust singing cicada. There's also the scissor grinder cicada. There's a couple other species that sing oftentimes uh, when it gets to be dusk, when it's crepuscular. So um, this particular cicada, the one that's on the screen right now, Robinson cicada, this is one of my favorite cicadas. And um, let me see if I can, because this one also, I just have to have one more cicada. <laughs> <laughs> this one, this one has a very familiar song to me too. And that can go on and on, right? So that one, I think is a very familiar one to people too. Okay, so those are the cicadas, they're the daytime singers. Then we get into these other singing orthoptera, different group, right? And they are using that stridulatory mechanism that I talked about in the beginning where the two wing edges rub together very, very quickly. Um, crickets, crickets are an enormous group and they have a lot of variability in their ecology and their habitat. Um, depending on what, what kind of cricket they are. And uh, most are omnivore, omnivores. They'll eat just about anything. They're scavengers. And a lot of them will sing both day and nighttime. The ones that we're going to be listening for are going to be mostly nighttime singers, or at least ones that we can listen for at dark or after dark. So this is a very familiar cricket. And this is actually two different species of fall cricket, or I'm sorry, field crickets. One is the fall field cricket. The other is the spring field cricket. And for the longest time, entomologists thought they were just one kind of cricket because they look alike, they sound alike. It was, you know, it took a, a, almost 100 years, I think, for them to quite figure it out that they were two different species. Um, but they have very different life cycles. The fall field cricket, emerges at a different time in the fall, but overwinters as eggs and starts singing in July, I'm sorry, in June. But the Springfield cricket overwinters as juveniles and they're going to appear early, appear earlier in the year. And these are like the big sort of classic cricket singers. Um, we used to have these guys, for those of you who've done the cricket crawl before, I know some of you have, we used to have the fall field cricket on our list, on our, um, our target list for listening. But we took it off because apparently the sand cricket, which is in the same genus, uh, there was some hybridization and it was very difficult to tell the two species apart in the hybrid zone, which runs through Maryland. So we, we decided not to have it in the cricket crawl any longer. But these basically are classic cricket singers. We do though have the Japanese burrowing cricket. And I'm gonna have to, I think I'm gonna have to use a different method here for the Japanese burrowing cricket. Let's see if you guys can hear this. This one is an introduced species, but we're not really sure it's invasive. I think a lot of people think, oh, introduced is invasive, but there's really not a lot of evidence that this is, this is an invasive species or a harmful species. Um, it's kind of moved around in ornamental plantings that have um, been brought up from the south. It entered into the United States um, from Japan in 1959. 
and this one is a, a burrowing cricket. So it sings from a burrow. The male will usually be found in like a, a crevice of a sidewalk or underneath a rock. So you're going to hear this one, but you're not going to see it right away. And, and if you follow the sound of it, you're probably going to have to find it in something. It's usually in the sidewalk or in a under a rock or in the brick wall, that kind of thing. Folks hear that? Eh, sort of. <laughs> okay, this one has a very, has a very mechanical sound um, and, and it's very fast. So it sounds like a sort of classic cricket chirper, but sort of very rapid. And um, this is one of our target species that we'll listen for. So, Kathy, um, yeah. Just gonna interrupt for one second. Sure. Um, when we're listening to the uh, samples that you have, yes. uh, is, it, is it one insect that's singing at the time that we're listening to? Usually, okay. um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, so usually this is one insect. And this is, and so I'm giving you the species song, the one insect that's singing, and this is the difference when you go outside you're going to hear a lot of these singing together oftentimes if they're choristers. Um, so it's a little bit more interesting when you go outside, uh, but that's okay because I'm going to, hopefully you can send everybody this talk as a PDF and then the links you can go to here are from Songs of Insects, which is a Will Hirschberger and Lang Elliott um, website. And that's an excellent way to learn the songs. So I'm going to just digress for a moment and talk about how cool insects are and specifically crickets this is a cricket story um, how cool insects are because of their rapid evolution um, I've given you the link here at the bottom of the slide if you want to go and look at this for yourself but this was really a fascinating story to me the um, the Pacific field cricket was introduced onto the island of Kauai and there were some folks who were studying it researchers and um, they came one year to the island and they just weren't hearing the Pacific field cricket and it turns out that there was an introduction of a parasite. Remember my first slide with the external parasite? Well, there was an introduction of a fly that parasitized the crickets by the male song. So the fly, the parasitic fly, would find the cricket by the male song and parasitize them. And these poor crickets on Kauai, that species had never encountered this parasite before. So the selective pressure was really high because they were totally naive, had never had this kind of predator before, right? And that population just tanked. And those poor researchers thought, oh no, this is it, all of our data, <laughs> it's gone, right? Um, but they kept coming back and they kept coming back and they realized after a while that it was pretty silent, that these crickets weren't really singing, but there were crickets everywhere. There were still Pacific field crickets everywhere, but they, but they just weren't singing. And they realized that in fact, what had happened was this mutation um, for silent wings had just run through the population. And it tells us a couple things. It tells us how short a generation is for, for crickets. So 20 generations of crickets takes about five years to happen. And that's what it took for this mutation to really take hold. Now, 90% of the crickets on Kauai have silent wings, right? And basically how it works is the, all of the guys with silent wings, they hang out next to that one poor guy who can still sing, right? So he's still singing away, calling in the females, right? But, uh, and, and, but the parasite comes in, parasitizes the one who's singing, but the silent males get to mate with the, with the females. And you have a couple things going on here. You have, um, you have crickets that are that are have a really simple mutation. It's just on one gene. It's on the on the X chromosome, and it's a uh, it's something that um, wouldn't happen except that the females in this in this species are not very choosy. So normally, what would happen is that the the males would sing. They have a singing song that calls in the females, and once the females get there, they have the male do a sort of little special song right? And almost all species have this, so that you have a big old calling song where the male calls to everybody, and then when the, the females get close, the females wait 
for the male to do that little special song, right? Like a little bit of baby talk kind of. And, um, and, if the, and if the male can't do it, sometimes the females won't mate with them and they're very choosy. But in this case, the females were not choosy. They didn't care. So that was, that was good for the crickets of Kauai and very good for the researchers, right? And a very interesting case of rapid evolution. Um, and if you are a teacher or an educator, this is a great site to go to, this Berkeley site. Um, they have a lot of these um, instances of evolution um, and often with insects. There's a ton of crickets. Um, and tree crickets are some of the really amazing ones. We don't really have any tree crickets on the cricket crawl count. They're very difficult to differentiate between them. Um, and they chorus. So they start to chorus. It's really difficult to differentiate between them, but they're really neat. They're cool animals. And when you're out listening for all of these species that I'm gonna, you know, I've been talking about, definitely listen for tree crickets. Um, they are usually sort of flattened and they're in different places in the canopy. So they might be kind of higher up or they might be mid-level. They're never on the ground, all right? So tree crickets are never on the ground, right? All the other ones I talked about, like the ground crickets, the Japanese burrowing cricket, the field crickets, they're on the ground. These tree crickets are mid-level or higher. They can be in shrubs, small trees, understories, that kind of things. They're great for the garden. Um, most suburban gardens have Davis's tree cricket and the two-spotted tree cricket. Um, and they're really cool. And one of the reasons I think they're really cool is because they use tools. It's terrifying, right? They're little insects, they use tools. This one has, has chewed a little baffle out of this leaf in order for this male to get his song a little bit louder, right? Because if the male gets a song a little bit louder, he's a, a lot more attractive to the females, right? And this is actually a picture of a male and a female mating. So this is the male. He's got his wings up, he's singing. He's probably doing that small, quiet song, that baby talk song. And the female crawls on his back to mate. And if she likes it, if she likes him, right? She's gonna mate with him. But he does something else to um, attract and keep his mate there, right? So maybe she just mate quick and leave, but she's not because he is secreting a little gift of food from a gland on his thorax. That's very cool, right? He's making a little bit of food for his partner um, to have her stick around so that he can continue to mate with her and another male won't mate with her, right? So, like I said, there's a lot of crickets. Um, bush crickets, they occur here. And I'm thinking the restless bush cricket is one that is very interesting. They, um, they have some populations that don't sing, but our restless bush crickets do sing. And you can sometimes find the males with mutilated forewings because they actually offer their forewings as a courtship gift to females. Remember how the, the one before was having the little, the little snack on the thorax? Well, the females actually snack on the male's wings. Um, and that's one way that the male keeps the female mating and, and engaged, right? So he makes sure that, that he's the dad. One of the ones we're gonna, ha we're gonna have in the cricket crawl is the um, jumping bush cricket. This is super common. And in our citizen science um, program we have for the past nine years, this is probably the most common species that we hear and that people hear. Let's see if this link is actually working. I call this the peeper of crickets. It sounds like peep, peep, peep. They make these individual, slightly longer, just one note songs. They're one of the easiest ones, at least to me, to go and pick out in a sort of suburban or even an urban mix. They're, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Um, they don't need much habitat in order to uh, occur. Um, and they are, are very reliable singers. 
right? And um, because they do that single song and they're not chorusers, they're easier to pick out sometimes. So you can go outside and listen and you can kind of get overwhelmed by all of the tree crickets. And that's what happens to people sometimes when they first go out is they, they're overwhelmed by the wall of sound that they're getting, which is actually amazing and wonderful. But if you're trying to pick out species songs, it can be a little daunting, but jumping bush crickets are pretty easy. So you guys will definitely hear those. I like the handsome trig because it's handsome. <laughs> um, you, we find these in gardens. These are very common suburban uh, crickets. They're called sword tail crickets because see the female's ovipositor, it looks like a sword. Um, and these, all of these animals are using plants. They're using plants to eat. They're using plants to lay their eggs. They're using plants to hide in, right? Um, there's a ton of ground crickets. These are the tiny little guys. People think they're baby crickets, but they're really grown up crickets. They're adults and they're ready to mate, but they're tiny. And they live in your yard and they're, they can be a ton of them and they can just like, just scatter when you walk in your yard or in your field or in the, in the clearing by your house or your woods or your park. Um, they're very common. And there's, there's several different species that actually look and sound alike too. So we didn't put them on the crawl, but they're still kind of amazing and, and neat to listen to. So now I'm getting into katydids. I really love katydids. And there is only one species of true katydid in North America. Um, and I'm going to actually, before I, this slide has a lot of information on it, I'm going to show you because wow, what a beauty, right? So this is our common true katydid. And I think this is the reason why I love the crawl so much because we get to go out and we really get to celebrate um, something that we never see. Because this, it's unusual to get a photo of a common true katydid because they are tree dwellers and they're homebodies. They don't like to leave the tree. One of the few sort of natural history writings we have about them basically says uh, they kind of get born in one tree, they stay there, they never leave, they die, that's it, okay? Um, I don't necessarily know if I believe that. I think they kind of get around more than people think, but they don't get around very easily. These wings, their function is to sing and to hide, right? Those are the two things they do best. They look exactly like a leaf. Look at the venation. So this animal is, is perfectly camouflaged. And see this dark brown? Those are the leading edges of the wings. They're going to rub together to call. I know this is a male common true Katie did, and I know that this is a singer right? And the common true katydids, they chorus. So when you first start listening for them in the evening, you might get, um, you might get individuals who are singing, right? But eventually you get this chorus that happens. Now, not everybody gets the chorus, honestly. I live in a suburban area that's fairly urban suburban, and we don't always get a chorus. We, we do get individuals singing, though. So let me see if I can play the individual song for you. And what's characteristic about this song is how even it is. Once they start, da-da-da, 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 they don't stop, right? Because there's some other things that are sort of, they might start and stop, but these guys don't stop. And eventually they all get together and they follow a, an alpha male. It's, whoa, I just lost my, my screen. Sorry. Um, <laughs> they get together and they they sing in a chorus so it's actually pretty cool let me just go back to it this is like the forest is just rocking with this if you've ever been camping and i think that's where i've, I've heard it i've heard it camping um, in, a, in a forested area, thickly forested area, you hear this chorusing and it's as if the whole forest is shaking with sound. It's pretty neat. Um, there are places that I have heard the chorus even in, um, even in suburbia and actually Northern Virginia is one of the places in Arlington. There's a piece of upland woods in uh, Long Branch, I think is the name of the park that I actually heard chorusing. That was about 10 years ago. So it would be interesting if, if it, they still do get chorusing there. So. The other cool thing about these animals is 
they have to have ears, right? Especially the females, both females and males have ears and they have them on their knees. Isn't that cool? Look at that, little ears on your knees. So you can like use your knees to like figure out where the male is singing so that you can cut through all the, the there's a lot of things singing out in the evening. So the females, they have a really daunting task. They have to be really excellent listeners and they have to figure out where the fittest male is, right? In order to go and, and uh, make a family. So, all right. There are several other katydids that are on the, the cricket crawl, and we call them false katydids, which I think is kind of, it's kind of rude because they're katydids, right? They're just not in the same group, right? Um, and you can tell the difference if you happen to see them because even though everybody looks like a leaf because that's very, very successful, which is convergence, right? We're seeing that. Um, this body form is super successful. Um, you can see the hind wings sticking out the back of the four wings here. That's characteristic of false katydids. If you go back to the true katydid, you see that rounded, that rounded four wing, you don't see the hind wings at all. And these wings don't work well for flight. So common true katydids usually do stay in the trees. We oftentimes find them after a big storm blows through and they get blown out of the tree and they're pretty much walking. They're walking back to the tree. Um, Whereas other katydids and crickets, they actually have functional, more functional wings and they can do some flying. So, so I, I'm, I'm hoping everybody's been able to hear the songs, okay? Especially you younger folks, because younger folks have much better hearing than us older folks, which is another reason why if you're gonna form a team for the cricket crawl, you should have an intergenerational team because the young folks have better hearing, right? The older folks, well, we're good with maps and snacks, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if we can hear the greater angle wing. This one's a tough one for people with hearing loss. This one kind of sounds like um, when you, if you have a gas stove and you turn on the knob, it goes tick, 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 tick. That's exactly what the male song is like. Tick, 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 tick. Um, and it's very, it's actually, it's very faint on this recording. And it's when you go out and listen in the evening to this, you really, the cl you're gonna only hear the ones that are fairly close to you, right? Um, so that's definitely gonna happen. So Kathy, mm -hmm. the the sound that we were listening to was just that the real high pitched, and then the the this background sound that was other, those were other insects, correct? They were other insects, and that is a big challenge when you actually go out and try to listen and identify a cricket and Katie did song. So you're going to find that. Um, you go out and listen, and there's all these other things singing, and it's incredibly beautiful, and it's sort of oh, kind of awe inspiring, right? But it's a little difficult. So I would say when people start this, I always say, um, just don't don't go out with an agenda the first couple nights. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna go out, like the first night you go out, although tonight's a really good night to go out, um, go out and just let it all wash over you the first time, and just just enjoy it because it's lovely and it's beautiful. And and then maybe maybe after a while, maybe after a while of doing that for a little bit, you try to pick out one or two songs, right? Um, and that's really, that's the best way to start learning it. And also have a laptop or a phone with you with the songs on it. So you can be like, I think that's the jumping bush cricket. And you can play the jumping bush cricket. And I'll tell you what, that is the, it will tell you right away whether that's what you're hearing. Um, it's a very good sort of accuracy check on if you're hearing what you think you are. Um, so we can provide habitat for these animals. Uh, we can't provide the forest probably for the common true katydid, but even in our backyards and, and small suburban areas, we can plant native plants. Um, we can plant things like goldenrod, perennials, um, and we can be, you know, we can create habitat. We can be lazy gardeners. Messy gardeners and lazy gardeners are the best gardeners for insects. Um, we don't need to use pesticides. We're not in production for food or, or anything else, right? Um, and so we can have these very welcoming yards. Also not mowing is a good one. I don't mow my backyard. 
I've, I'm, I have to know my neighbors well, <laughs> but I, I don't mow my backyard very much. I mow it every once in a while, um, but I do mow my front yard. So um, there are ways to manage your small piece of, of property, if you have it, um, to be more friendly, not just to crickets and katydids, but to insects in general, because they're essential for life, right? Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. Can you see the cricket? Right there. Very well camouflaged, right? This is a female. I watched her, I watched her just ovipositing. I don't for I don't know for how long. This is a red maple. She was just ovipositing in every crevice in the in the bark of this red maple for, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour until I had to move on because I was out doing some survey work outside. And um, this is where these, these animals become very, very important. Um, they're integral, right? They're, they're essential for the food chains, for the systems of energy transfer that keep everyone alive, okay? So in winter, the Carolina chickadees diet is about half animal, guess what? a lot of that diet is going to be insect eggs and a lot of those insect eggs are going to be crickets and katydids. And that brings me to the big why care about them, right? Um, and certainly as a sort of science person and as somebody who understands the, the, their essential role in our ecology, they keep us alive because they're a primary consumer and they're part of the trophic chain, right? They, they're excellent food for other animals. Um, but why else care about them? I mean, as a scientist, we want to understand them because we want to we want to study them. We want to find out about them. We want to understand variations and trends in population, you know. But there's another reason why we, I think we should care about them. Actually, um, they've been around for a very long time, and I'm going to see if this link works as well. About 165 million years ago, and that's the sound of 165 million years ago. And you're telling me, oh, Kathy, how can you, how can you have a sound from 165 million years ago? Because there was a fossil of a fossilized pair of cricket or cricket wings, very ancient cricket. And the fossil was so good that they were able to recreate the wings and then recreate the song of the cricket. So you pretty much resurrected this animal from 165 million years ago. And that's really why we should care to me. Anyway, um, I realized how incredibly important they are um, because they were around when we didn't have music, we didn't have all of the entertainment we have, we weren't talking, but we were listening to the crickets and the katydids, right? So I think we should still be listening. And it's an extraordinary joy, especially in a time of year when things have been very ephemeral and uh, out of our control. You can still walk outside and you can listen to the sound that has been going on for a very long time. It's been part of our, our species for a very long time, right? So the cricket crawl. This is something that's been going on for, this is our ninth year this year. Um, next year it'll be 10, will be the magical 10 years. Um, it started in 2012. And this is a, I am sorry that this is the old date as my um, screen capture on this slide. Um, that is the wrong date. Oh, well, actually it's August 21st, right? So it is the right date. It's, it's Friday. It's just the wrong year. Um, so it's 2012 we started this. And um, the first, very first cricket crawl was done in New York City. Um, and it, it was Sam Drogi and some folks in the Natural History Museum in New York City and they had a wonderful um, experience for the cricket crawl. Unfortunately, no one ever sort of took up the mantle and kept it going and um, kept counting in New York City. And uh, Sam Drogi was on my graduate committee at that time. And Sam turned to me and said, well, Kathy, you're going to do this, right? And I was like, okay, because that's what you do when somebody on your graduate committee says, do something. You say yes. Um, so we have. We've been doing it since 2012. We use the Songs of Insects website a lot because it's a great resource for the songs, although there is a download available on our website when our website is working um, of the six target songs. This is another website that's excellent for um, folks who want to go further into exploring 
what all of the different species are because I've only gone over maybe a dozen species of singing insects, but there are hundreds, right? And if you want to go further and explore those, uh, Tom Walker is the granddaddy basically of all of the singing insect research in North America. And um, the University of Florida, I believe, maintains his site now. He is retired. Um, but Sina, Singing Insects of North America, is still around um, in some form. So these are the six species. And these are the links for them on this slide. Jumping bush cricket, Japanese burrowing cricket, the lesser angle wing, which we didn't hear, um, the greater angle wing, the common katydid, and the oblong winged katydid. Now, I'm not, I'm going to kind of skip ahead. Normally, what we would do this time of year is I would be, I would have been out already with people for a couple of weeks and run some um, training sessions with folks because I find that, you know, the first time you go out, you, you really need somebody to kind of help you over that sort of, oh my God, I'm hearing a lot of things singing and kind of pick out the songs. But I'm going to trust that you guys basically working, especially with other people, are going to be able to do that on your own. Um, this is from times past when folks would go out at night and we would listen. Um, I also want to just stop here right now and say, you know, make sure that you're safe. Um, go out in a, a, a family or friend unit that, that you're safe together and also you're safe wherever you're counting. Um, if the park that you want to go to doesn't let people in after dark, don't trespass, right? I'm not telling you to do that. I want you to be safe and I want you to stay within the law, right? So, so make sure that you have fun, but stay safe. That first year, we had a lot of participation, nearly 2,000 observations in Baltimore and DC um, and Northern Virginia too. Uh, and Arlington has been a great county for folks who are counting. You guys always come through and, and send in lots of data. Um, we had about 150 groups that took part in the crawl in that, in that first year. And we recorded a lot of observations. And apparently for some people, not only uh, did they listen to the, to the Katie dids, but they had them come in and do their dishes. Um, they didn't do that for me, but you know, maybe I just don't know the language. I don't know. <laughs> Here's some data. This is kind of, I've been sort of debating whether to take this slide out, honestly. Um, this is raw data. Um, this is not transformed, right? And. Um, what I have is I have the, the uh, Japanese burrowing cricket, and this is the percent of impervious surface on the locations where the call was heard. And this is the, basically the probability of, of hearing the animal based on, the, based on the, the site, and the site is based on the, um, is categorized by impervious surface, right? So least impervious surface, most impervious surface. Yeah, um, people who yes. know what impervious surface is. Yeah, um, concrete, uh, no, no trees, no grass, right? So rooftops, sidewalks, driveways, roads, right? Um, basically, an urban landscape has a lot of impervious surface. A less urban landscape has less, usually has less impervious surface. So the more trees and the more grass, the more things like that, but for the, for the, this is interesting because for the, um, the Japanese boring cricket, it doesn't really seem to make a difference. It, it sort of the probability of hearing it didn't really change that much. Um, there wasn't a trend that we could see. But with the common true Katie did, what we see is an inverse correlation. All right, we see an inverse relationship. And that's not um, unsurprising right? Because these animals are very tied to trees. They, they have to have trees. So basically, you're much more likely to hear a common true katydid if there's a lot less impervious surface. But look at this. Sometimes there's 100% impervious surface, and you still, 30% of the time, you're hearing a common true katydid. That actually tells me that they're doing okay in some very urban areas. And we see that. And especially in, in my, my experience is DC. Um, in DC, we have a big park that runs through a, a very urban area, the city. And that park acts as an island where these um, common true katydids can keep coming from, right? And you can hear them and they can migrate out. I don't know how far they migrate. I'd love to know. That's for the next generation of researchers. And I'm talking to you right now, whoever you are. <laughs> 
All right, we need to know, we need to know how those katydids are moving. So I just thought I'd share that. Um, this is for the next year. We didn't get as much, we, we didn't get as much data um, and we didn't really see the trend as well. So, all right, so these are some of the resources that I've used this evening. Um, and these are some acknowledgements. I'd like to say thank you to, to folks, um, to the various folks at uh, USGS, Fish and Wildlife, Lang Elliott and Will Hirschberger, um, Tom Walker, um, Linda and Charlie Davis, uh, Lisa Alexander and Stephanie Mason at Audubon Naturalist Society, and all the new folks there, Sarah Nella and some other folks there too that um, I should probably have on the slide and I need to update it. Um, and this is the new cricket crawl slide. So August 21st, we hope everybody's going to attempt to go out there on Friday with a very safe pod of your family or friends and in a very safe place. If that's just your front step, that is okay. That is fine. Um, I've had people ask me if they could count the same place a number of times and we don't want you to do that. That's, um, if you're going to count one place, excellent. Just count it once right? And send that data to us. And I'll tell you what, um, you can stay out and listen all night if you want to. Although the crickets and katydids, at least the katydids, will stop singing probably around midnight or into the early morning hours. They really, they stop after a, a point. Um, crickets, crickets sometimes sing um, through the evening and they actually start to sing, or if they stop, they start to sing again right before um, dawn. We sometimes Kathy, somebody asks what the best time is to go a cricket crawling. Excellent question. Good question. So you want to go when it's truly dark. Um, you really want to, to be at your site. And if you want to be at your site when it's daylight, that's fine. But you want to start your listening, your, your one minute listening after 830. So after 830 p.m., that's when you want to start counting. Now you can count 830, you can count at nine, but you, you want one place one time counting. So if you're in one place, count one time for one minute, right? And then move on to some other place if you want to do several different counts. And zeros are okay. I think a lot of people think, oh, I have to hear things, right? It's great if you hear something in that one minute, but be honest, if you don't hear something in that one minute, that tells us something. That's interesting data and, and zeros are okay, all right? So I think that's my end slide. Um, if there's um, anybody who has questions, um, I'm open to questions. Something that was confusing. Um, Kathy, one person wrote, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this. It says, on summer nights, I often hear an insect that will occasionally make this four note call that goes S S S. And then repeat it again a few seconds later. Maybe Kim, maybe Kimberly wants to come on and and, and imitate her the sound, and she wants to. Know I think I know what it her. is. Okay. I, okay. Can you hear me? Is this Kimberly? Yeah. Let me let me stop. Let me actually let me let me stop the share, so I can see you. Oh, I don't have my right. camera on. Um, okay, okay, this is embarrassing, but it, it's this insect that goes, and then like four seconds later, it will repeat the same thing, like. Hmm. There are some meadow katydids that sort of like, they kind of sound like that. No, it, it's, it's definitely like a s or a sh sound. It's like, s -s 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 and it's very loud. It's louder than other insects. I sometimes hear it when I'm going to sleep at night and, and then I can hear it like right out my window. Oh, I think you're hearing the lesser angle wing. Um, and I didn't play it. Um, let's see. might be that. Go and, go and listen again, um, because depending on how close you are to that animal, it can be really loud. So if it's like, 
if it's like two feet away from you, it might be super, super loud and it's very buzzier. It's buzzier sounding when it's closer to you. I think that um, might be it. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's <laughs> one of our target species. So, and it can be very loud. So awesome. Good question. All right. Um, Kathy, people are wondering how do they actually submit the data? Good question. Um, you are going to, you can use our phone number, which of course I don't have on me. I forgot to write it down to, to share. Um, but you can, you can call us. We would prefer that you text us because that's actually the best way to do it. You can text us. You can um, email us at speciesobs at gmail.com. So S-P-E-C-I-E-S-O-B-S at gmail.com. That is absolutely the best way is just to email us. <clears throat> email is the best way to get us. Um, you, can, you can text us, you can actually leave a voicemail message, but it's sort of comical trying to figure out sometimes how the translate thing works on the, on the voicemail messages. Sometimes we have an issue with that. <laughs> what data do you, you want? Just, do you just wanna hear, you just want people to tell you what they heard and where? So yeah, that's what's super important. You wanna have, I wanna have um, where you are. So the very first thing, where are you? You know, where are you? Cross streets are very good for us. Cross streets and then, or an address. And, you know, we won't, we won't put your address on the, on the website. We won't do that. We, we're just gonna, we're gonna gather it for ourselves, okay? So oh, a, an address is great. A cross street is great. Um, some sort of um, description of where you are along a main road. Um, and definitely tell us where you are. Like I am in Baltimore County, in or I am in Darnstown or I am in you know Queen Anne's County so give us location information then give us um, your one minute count I heard three species right I heard jumping bush cricket I heard um, common tricady did and I heard the lesser angle wing um, and then tell us who you are because that's very important everybody needs a cool team name sorry folks but I have to have fun too <laughs> So it's great when folks pick a good team name and, um, and, and I'll, sometimes I'll say, oh, you win, you get the best team name for the night, we all decide. Uh, Vegan Biker Gang was one of my favorites. Um, also Lit Up and Listening was, a, was another one that, I, that we really liked. Um, somebody has already um, put their claim on Quarantine, which I thought was brilliant um, for their team name. So um, yeah, just a, a, a nice team name. Also, transects are nice. And I know that this not, might not be a familiar idea, but sort of making a line with say a quarter mile distance in between. So you sample here, you go a quarter mile, you sample here, you go a quarter mile, you sample there. And this gives us a, a sort of a, a snapshot of an area, actually. Um, we had Nate Irwin, who was with the Smithsonian for a long time. He had a team uh, a few years back, and he, he did this a few years, where he took the subway from um, the yellow line, and he took that home. And they got, the team got off and counted on the subway at every stop, and they made that their transect. Um, I've had people go to bars, <laughs> count outside of one bar, go to another bar, count outside of that bar. But that's a grown-up cricket roll. <laughs> I don't think we're doing that this year. <laughs> um, so, so do you recommend at least uh, a quarter mile between each site? That's good. I mean, that's really good. I mean, I know some people do this when they're walking and they may have a little bit less. That's okay. That's all right. If you can give me a really good address, um, we can differentiate the sites. So, it looks like Alicia. I have a question. question. Yeah. Can crickets use echolocation? Um, for finding the like for finding. So if the female's looking for the male. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe because sometimes you know sometimes they do make a little the females even though they don't sing they make a little response ticking with their, and they don't, they make it with their wings, right? They click and they tick with their wings. So they may be, I don't know if they do or not though. That's an excellent question. And actually, if you guys want to go research that, that would be really cool. Um, because I do know, like I said, that the females will make this little click or tick in response. So good question. Sorry, I can't answer it. Couple more questions, Kathy. Um, mm -hmm. this, do the female true Katie dids walk over to the best male singer? They do, they do. <laughs> so, 
so yeah um so they're 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 doing a lot of walking through those to tree leaves so they better look like a leaf right um, and then earlier on when you were talking about that fascinating um uh, story about the Kauai uh, crickets. Do you think that there eventually will be no singers? Well, that would be interesting because they kind of need the wingman, right? That that guy is actually acting like a wingman, and he's uh, he's calling the females in. If there is a a population that is completely silent, I'm not sure how well they'll do reproductively. So, I mean, there are some silent crickets and. There are some species in that group that in, in Orthoptera that don't sing. So that's a good question. That's the kind of thing where, you know, as a researcher, you want to just keep watching that population. So and were the were the females always not picky with their males or did that yeah. change? Yeah, high level of a lot of not picky females. So there weren't picky females, which is the, the reason why it worked. All right, are there any other, oh, we have some more. Do females fight over the best male singer? Not that I know of. Um, I, I have not read that. Now, males will sometimes fight, um, but, but not females. So as far as I know, once again, you know, like time to do a little Google Scholar search or something. <laughs> but this, this is science in action. You have a question and you go out and you, you try to get a, an answer to it. You do, yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard a catbird and mockingbird imitate the cicada. I think it was a lunch gathering strategy. Can we send you an audio if we're uncertain of what kind of cricket also? Um, you can, but I'm going to be busy, kind of busy entering data. So it might be hard for me to listen at the time, but some people do send me sound files. Um, and you can try and I will try and I will try and listen to figure out what you've got. So yes but I may not be able to get back to you quickly, but that's okay. You can send me files. All right. Is that it? Well, we don't, I don't have any other questions. Does anybody have any questions? You can type them in. Um, I think that this was fascinating. I'm so excited about getting out there and getting my ears working and trying to get new ear maps on what's going on outside and around me. Um, and participating in collecting data that can really be used to uh, further our scientific knowledge of the ecosystems that are, are that are around us. So thank you so much, Kathy, for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Um, I look around and everybody's brain is a little bit bigger. I see that. And I know that we're all ready to go out and, and cricket call. And as I said here on the Zoom, I hope that we can all um, Cricket crawl together next year uh, on multiple occasions. So I will try to make this presentation available to everyone so that you can go back and um, study up on the sound calls. You do have the website of the, what was the website that I put down here? Songs of Insects. Songs of Insects is very, it's, it's very good. Um, the quality of the recordings is excellent. Our website, you can get downloaded um, a data form and that has all the instructions on it. So, and that's working right now. I know our landing page, if you hit our landing page, you can download that data form. Um, and the Songs of Insects site is a great one to use to go out and listen and um, sort of verify what you're hearing, so. All right. Well, thank you guys. It was it was lovely to um, to talk tonight, and good to see folks. Um, I hope to hear from everybody on Friday, and don't get discouraged. Go out there and practice a little tonight because it's a really nice night for it. And Kathy, yeah. you do have a rain date. You said that there is a rain date. You want there is a rain date. We we won't be counting on Friday if it's actively raining. Um, and, and if it's if it's rainy right around dusk and into the evening, no one's, well, the crickets will sing, but the katydids won't be singing. So we'll probably do it Saturday. And if it's raining Saturday, uh, just watch the website. We're, we'll, maybe we'll do it next weekend. So, but hopefully it looks, right now, it looks like Friday's good weather. So I hope I didn't jinx it. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you so much. Everybody have a wonderful evening and hope to see y'all um, next week for feathers on Thursday. All right. Take care. Thank you guys so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Did you know? Tony wants to talk to you.
Very Thank good. You. Is Kathy still there? No, she left. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll email her. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bronwyn. All right, Jean. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.